Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today kicks off the start of our Suikoden retrospective series. We'll be taking a look at all the Suikoden mainline titles, one through five, and doing reviews on them, seeing how they held up, seeing kind of where the series started, where it ended at, and stuff like that, and seeing kind of, you know, what makes this series very special. Um, kind of as a, a little bit of a spoiler, I did uh, play Suikoden in two, three, and four when I was growing up, but it's been over a decade since I've touched those games. I had actually never played Suikoden one ever. Um, we were having some pretty good discussions on Twitter as well as in Discord as well. Link to the community Discord will be in the description below. But there was a lot of people telling me that like, hey, Suikoden one had a lot of great things, a lot of great elements. So I was really curious to actually try it myself. And it actually ended up impressing me in quite a bit of different ways. So if you are new here, please make sure you like, comment, subscribe. We are on the road to 1000 subscribers. That's the goal that we're aiming for right now. And I'm really looking forward to tackling all the Suikoden series. We will be streaming this weekend in three, four, and five over on the Twitch channel. So if you're interested in live gameplay, feel free to give me a shout over there. But without further ado, let's jump into it. Suikoden 1 Retrospective, live now. The Suikoden series has always held a very special place in mind in many gamers' hearts. With its powerful themes, beautiful character development, and overarching storylines across its chronology, there is a lot to appreciate in this at times very criminally overlooked RPG series. From its world building to its almost universally excellent art style and character portraits, well for the most part, Suikoden like carries with it many unique attributes for an RPG from its era. Now let's talk about how this diamond in the rough came to be. Now mind you, with this game pushing damn near 30 years old, some information was relatively scarce to come by. I'd like to go over some of the finer bullet points here, but I did want to give a huge shout out to the guys over at Arcadeology for compiling a very meticulous list of the development cycle. If you're curious in this aspect, feel free to check out the video, the link will be in the description below. Now a lot of these quirks and nuances that have to do with Suikoden and Suikoden as a series have to do with some of the precarious conditions that the game came to fruition under. The game was developed under the guidance of Yoshitaka Moriyama to be one of the flagship titles for a yet unannounced Konami. Console. Wait, hold on a second. Let me take a look. They are not found. Needless to say, this console unfortunately never came to fruition. Instead, Moriyama was given a team and the subsequent choice to make either a bracing game, baseball game, or an RPG. Thankfully, for all our sake, the team decided to take a stab at creating a JRPG for the newly announced PlayStation console. PlayStation. This being a somewhat new endeavor for Konami at the time, the team was eager to attempt to provide a very different take on some of the JRPG tropes for its time. This led to Moriyama experimenting with plot lines and story arcs that take from traditional Chinese folklore while incorporating Western elements and thematic structures to help make the story more palatable to a Western audience. Now, one major element also to discuss was the current climate at the time regarding RPGs and Suikoden's release window of 1995. Having been released at the conclusion of a year that saw releases of Earthbound, Breath of Fire 2, Two, Lunar Eternal Bound, and the one and only Chrono Trigger, and we all know how I feel about that game, I could only compare it to being told that you had to close a concert after both Michael Jackson and Prince, or do a stand-up routine following Eddie Murphy and George Carlin. But even more auspicious considering that this was Konami's first time of the bat within the JRPG category for the PlayStation console. So let's talk about what I believe is easily the strongest aspect of Suikoden as a whole, its story, specifically its character developmental arcs. You ask any Suikoden fan what they remember the most about any Suikoden title, and characters and story is normally very close to the top of their list. Now why is that? What about the story Suikoden was powerful enough to propel it into a full-blown franchise stretching over 20 years with various spin-offs across different platforms and yes you know the almighty pachinko machines. The framework of Suikoden is loosely based off Water Margin, a well-known Chinese tale, which ties into well-known elements such as a young hero recruiting 108 stars of destiny to change the outcome of any given conflict. This is the general setting for all the stages for each Suikoden, and the OG is no different. You start the game off as Tyr McDole, the son of Teal McDole, one of the five great generals in the city of Greg Minister, which is governed in the land of the Scarlet Moon Empire. Tyr is set to start his first day of military training when a routine mission goes awry, leading to one of his childhood friends, Ted, explaining that he is a holder of one of the 27 true runes, in particular the Soul Eater rune. Ted elects to sacrifice himself and transfer the rune onto Tyr, thus setting our plot and narrative afoot. Now, this isn't something necessarily unique to most RPGs. In fact, most flow something like this. While most of us JRPG fanatics know what's coming, doesn't mean that we can't enjoy the ride. And what a hell of a ride it is. Suikoden has you traversing every square inch of the world to help unify forces against the court magician Wendy and the Empire. As someone who actually ended up playing the games canonically out of order, I was very intrigued to see the genesis of many of the series' favorites such as Flick, Victor, Luke, and more on their initial foray. While the story itself on a surface level may seem relatively straightforward, the game does an excellent job in dabbling and showcasing in a variety of themes, from loss, hope, sacrifice, corruption, and the evergreen, the hero's journey. 
Just to name a few, we come to find out that the Scarlet Moon Empire has slowly rotted from within from its once prestigious past due to Wendy's corrupting influence on the Emperor Barbosa. As time enters on, we are given an eye-opening account into how the Scarlet Moon Empire is viewed from ordinary citizens in villages throughout the land. Suffice it to say, it's not all sweet out there. Speaking on the villages, one of Suikoden's strongest attributes and one that only gets better in subsequent sequels is its focus on diversity. The world is populated from everything from villages full of elves, dwarves, dragons, and kobolds, and the game does an exceptional job at showing what's truly on the line not just for our hero, but the entirety of the world and its occupants. As the plot continues to unfold, and we continue to build our rebel forces to oppose the Empire, one of Suikoden's strongest traits comes to the forefront for the player. It's unrelenting, harrowing depiction of a revolution in all facets that it entails. I think it's safe to say, of all the Suikoden titles that I play, that'll be one through four, that this is by far the most brutal. From the loss of childhood friends seemingly every other chapter to a showdown with your own father, it really makes you build a very strong connection with our protagonist and does a great job at making the player feel the weight of the decisions he's forced to make as the leader of the rebel faction. This is all out war, and in war there are seldom any black and white correct answers. Do we lop off this general's head or do we let him atone for their sins by joining our party? This is a sample of many costly decisions you have to make throughout your playthrough. While this story isn't something necessarily we haven't seen before in other titles, Suikoden's X Factor comes in two flavors. First, the 27 true runes. In the world of Suikoden, as opposed to having magic locked behind a standard spell progression system like, say, Final Fantasy, magic is subjugated via the use of runes that are imbued in either the hands or the forehead of the user. Within the universe of Suikoden, there are 27 true runes, ancient and immensely powerful artifacts, which give the host a slew of powers up to and including immortality. While only the surface is scratched here in Suikoden 1, its premise lends enough mystique and intrigue for world building to lay the foundation for an entire franchise. The story is gradual build on the importance and impact of the 27 true runes is intriguing enough to be its own story path. The other X factor would be the game's focus on the 108 stars of destiny. As the game progresses, one of your main additional goals is an attempt to recruit as many stars of destiny to your cause in order to help you bolster your fighting strength and to drive others to your cause. One way to think about this is a bit like Pokemon. Sure, you can beat all the gems and fight the Elite Four, but did you actually and truly complete the game if you didn't manage to nab all 150 Pokemon? The same idea is extended here in spades. The recruitment process is handled in tandem with you building and evolving your base of operations. Seeing your castle expand to swell to accommodate all these new faces and factions is one of the most satisfying elements within the entirety of the game. Going into the 108 Stars of Destiny, this is where the game truly shines. Each recruit has their own conditions to join your cause, while having some excellent personality types and driving motivations. As you continue to recruit, some may join on a mere whim, while others will literally have you running all across the creation to find items to satisfy their conditions before they will join up with you. Could I interest you in everything, all of the time? A little bit of everything, I am having a very time. bad day! Apathy, I am in no mood! This one of the worst days that I've had in a long time! I'm not in the mood to play with anybody! Generally, the dialogue for the 108 stars is handled quite well, with some of them having pretty snarky and outlandish personality types, while some wanting to do nothing more than to just lop heads off. My job is cutting off the heads of criminals. But as you see, Business has been slow lately. All I can do is cut off heads. That's all I know. Are you sure? <laughs> Whoa! Wait, what's it? Now, while I'm a huge fan of the majority of the formula that goes into both the story and world setting here, there is a one area that the game stumbles, albeit just slightly. With Tyr being the atypical silent protagonist type, there were several situations where his lack of expression or emotiveness of any type really became quite jarring. In particular, after the faded one-on-one -on -one duel with his father, Tyr isn't given any type of dialogue options not a single syllable. And it serves to disconnect any type of cathartic reaction that the player itself might need regarding this landmark event within Tyr's life. Now, Tyr loses a lot in this game, and I just never got the feeling that this was conveyed appropriately throughout the game's dialogue options or lack thereof. Sometimes having a supporting cast member be a mouthpiece for our protagonist just doesn't suffice. We need to hear from the character directly. Now, I understand that this was par for the course for many games that came out during this generation. The exact same function is executed in one of my favorite RPGs of all time, Chrono Trigger. Now, I dare say that a lot of the trials and tribulations that young Tyr endures are a great deal more personal and intimate in nature, which in my very humble opinion would warrant more expressive options from the protagonist. Just a tiny nitpick there. Now to make up for that, one thing that this game gives you in absolute spades 
is stellar characters. From standouts like Flick and Victor to the six great generals of the Empire, each character is given its own flair and mannerisms to help fill the void where our main character would normally take center stage. One of the key standout elements is the level of nuance and depth both ally and foe are given. There are a few atypical just flat out villains within the game, and the game does a marvelous job of displaying the intricacies of the cast, worldviews, and their driving motivations. All things considered, being what it is, the story holds up fairly well, 8 out of 10. But what good is a kick-ass story if the game is no fun to play? Let's talk about gameplay. The game offers a total of three different battle types, traditional turn-based actions that you use throughout most of the game to play through in dungeons, major strategic battles, and one-on-one -on -one duels. Let's start with combat, shall we? Whilst being a turn-based RPG, there are a number of differentiating factors that Suikoden has, namely in its Unite system, which allows several party members to join to perform joint attacks. Number two is its emphasis on knockouts within a battle. If you die, you're typically dead throughout the remainder of that battle unless you use a very specific accessory to allow you to survive mortal attacks. And lastly, the game's magic system being the other major key differentiator as mentioned above, the rune system. Party Unite system is pretty kick-ass, and seeing what quirky and devastating team attacks are able to be discovered and utilized throughout the game is easily one of the highlights in regards to combat. Moving on to the somewhat stricter death system, this game isn't necessarily at what I would say fire emblem hard. It does force a player to stay focused regarding health and resource management. Losing even one teammate in a difficult battle can easily turn the ties from being difficult to somewhat insurmountable. For the most part, run-of-the-mill encounters are relatively forgiving, making the game a great entry-level game for those looking to peruse into the JRPG category, with the key exception of being Necklord. Batman is an absolute unit. Lastly, for the standard combat, let's talk about the rune magic system. Almost all fighters, sans and animal creatures, are able to equip and utilize runes in battle. Runes have properties that vary from offensive magic, such as lightning and fire, to defensive magic, such as earth and water, with a myriad of specialized runes and options for weapons and magic combinations parsed throughout. Each rune is broken down into four tiers. Each has a specific allotment that increases depending on the character's current level. The higher the level, the more they can utilize each rune's magic level. For the most part, I find the balancing of the runes to be pretty excellent, allowing the player to experiment with certain setups and combinations to suit their current team comps and strategies. All in all, I still find this approach to be one of my favorites within all of JRPGs, as its emphasis on resource management and character evolution to get to higher tiers, I found to be exceptionally rewarding. Moving on to major battles, this is an element that plays off very much like a large scale rock, paper, scissors, with the standard option being charge, bow, and magic options that naturally counter out and lose to each other depending on which option was selected. There's a bit more nuance added as your army grows with certain units providing exceptional and at times very OP options that almost render the entire idea of strategy completely inert. Of note, this is an area where you can permanently lose one of your 108 stars of destiny, thus upping the ante significantly from a game of digital stratego to a battle that requires the player's focus. Lastly, on the combat side of the house, you get pretty excellent one-on-one -on -one duels that are generally tied to key events within the game. All in all, I would say they're handled quite well and give a very rewarding sense of accomplishment if you're choosing to do a blind without a strategy guide. Calling out an enemy's bluff and blowing up bad decision making by your opponent feels very good. Let's transition to more standard gameplay fare. Now, a few things regarding the gameplay of Suikoden have unfortunately aged like milk. Of note, the inventory system and item management. Suikoden has the worst item management system of any game I have ever touched. Instead of having one main party inventory, each character has a finite amount of items that they can carry on their persons at any given time. This includes the armor that they have equipped as well. So needless to say, with dungeons and treasure drops, each character's inventory is prone to fill up quite quick. Don't stress it though, we have a warehouse. Wait, he sucks ass too. Do you have business in my vault? Fuck you mean your storehouse, this is my castle. I think out of the 40 or so recorded gameplay hours I have in my save file, at least a solid four to five of those were spent managing my inventory and going up and down stairs to swap out characters to manage their inventory. You see, as the narrative to the game evolves, you often need to use very specific characters for very specific quests. Hiking up and down those steps within your castle became an absolute dread. Even when you're given a pretty excellent elevator, it still overall is a very cumbersome ordeal. Another very curious design decision was that your main character doesn't have access to a dash within cities, dungeons, the world map, unless a character has a holy rune equipped within your party. Now, while I can kind of sort of see why they may have wanted to force a player to make a trade off for better efficiency, elements like these sadly don't hold up very well, and in the end, only end up hindering potential replayability of this game significantly. Despite these shortcomings, I found the overall gameplay to be relatively solid solid and innovative for his era, 8 out of 10. One thing that is almost universally loved from most fans that have played any Suikoden in title is a standout musical production. Series composer Miki Higashino delivers several masterclass compositions that perfectly encapsulate the world our heroes encompass. 
Having worked on previous titles such as Gradius and several other Konami titles, it's quite satisfying to see her come into her own with her own distinct sound and signature across every track. From each town's theme song to pitch perfect character themes, Miss Higashino's ability to tie consistent emotive experience throughout the game's 30 plus hour runtime deserves all the praise I can give. Despite hearing numerous melodies such as your headquarters theme song or the Chinchorin dice game theme repeatedly, they seldom ever ran thin. As I mentioned a bit earlier, this game at times is a very somber and harrowing affair, dealing with great loss and sacrifice. I don't think any of the emotional moments in this game would have landed anywhere near as good as they did without her composition. In particular, the theme of a moonlit night and touching theme are masterful compositions that only get better with each subsequent listen. Between Suikoden 1 and 2, this in my very humble opinion is Miss Higashino's magnum opus and will forever maintain its world class status. Music, 10 out of 10. Now if you were to tell me that this game would go on to spawn a series that houses two of the arguably best and most celebrated RPGs of all time based off the sole merits of this game, I would just flat out simply not believe you. For a debut title that likely had aspirations of giving life to a slew of sequels, Suikoden had a lot of ground to cover. In order to convince both Konami bigwigs and the ever-changing landscape of JRPG fans that this title has something special to offer. So this game had a couple branching pathways it could potentially take. Was it going to be a blistering commercial success? Or would it have to attempt to find its audience through a more patient approach showing that it had just enough unique properties to warrant a curious gamer's interest? And that its full package would be enough to create an almost cult-like fan base of small but staunch series reporters. Suikoden does a lot of things great, and all things considered, the core principles of this game hold up quite well after 27 plus years. Being the first First game in the series, up the bat, it does one thing incredibly well. It sets up the foundation for the Suikoden universe and hedges expectations brilliantly about what these games are all about, the story and the world. I found this to be very true with each subsequent story for the direct sequels between 1 and 4. This game's focus is to deliver a powerful and moving narrative, and a lot of its thematic choices reflect this as well. So if I had to sum the in 1 in a few choice words, it would come down to raw, unrefined potential. I equate it to watching a new film from a director at a film festival. You can see that they have something very special to offer with their craft, and they only need a bit of time for it to blossom into the potential that is so abundantly clear under the surface. Let me spin this in another way. One of the best comparisons I can make is from one of my favorite film trilogies of all time, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight Batman trilogy, specifically Batman Begins. Now, is this a perfect movie? No, not by any stretch of the imagination, and some of the elements have aged poorly for its time. Now, one element that it greatly excelled at was building the new world of Gotham whilst populating it with excellent characters and setting the stage for more complex and powerful stories from its successors waiting in the wings. Suikoden 1 is all those things to me. It sets the stage grandly for what's to come, and at the end of the day, it's what most series progenitors strive for. Overall, 8 out of 10, a flawed yet intriguing start to one of my favorite RPG series of all time. So that's it for our Sweeken in One uh, retrospective, guys. I appreciate you guys sticking around to the end of the video. What I want to hear is what you guys like about Sweeken in One and what about it made you a huge Sweeken in fan overall, right? I want to hear about that in the comments. Drop a comment. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Let me know uh, what you want to see next. We already have Sweeken in Two in the wings, but I'm open to any other content ideas. I appreciate you guys. LC signing out. Peace.